It's spring, one of the most amazing times of the year that the air is filled with the beautiful aroma of rotting fish and f and from what? One of the worst, most destructive invasive trees in all of North America. You can see a few of them flowering behind me. It's Bradford pear. These trees should be removed yesterday. And when they're flowering in the spring, it's a great time to be able to easily spot them for removal. However, there's a chance, a chance, that it could be two other trees that have similar looking flowers. Number one is native wild plums, and the other are feral fruiting pear trees that are non-native, but not invasive. They're actually really easy to tell apart at the flowering stage. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. All right, let's talk about Bradford pear and wild plums. We're back in the studio for this one. It's been a long time. Let me know if you guys wanna see more videos that are filmed in this space. I want to give you guys a set of details that can be used in different circumstances. So some that can be used from far away and others that you can use up close to be absolutely certain of which one is which. We'll start with the ones that are from further away that you could see from a distance or maybe if you're passing by and you're in a car and you're seeing them, not if you're driving. Do not scout and drive for wild food. That is not recommended. But nonetheless, here are the things that you can be looking for. So the first one is the growth habit, which is very, very different between the two of these. So first off, Bradford pear grows much taller than wild plums do. If you're seeing a tree that is much greater than 20 feet, already almost certainly that is a Bradford pear. Another thing about them is that Bradford pear tends to grow very tall and narrow. So at the top, it's more narrow than it is at the bottom and it'll usually be widest maybe at the base or in the middle on Bradford pear. Wild plum is completely different. So again, it's usually gonna be growing below 20 feet, actually usually below 15 feet, and it has an open crown. So it'll be widest at the top and narrowest at the base. Okay, so those are things that you should be able to easily see even from afar. And now let's say you're getting a little bit closer, you're seeing a few more details. So at a medium distance, what I want you to look for is that the color of the bark between these is very different as well as the texture. So on younger branches of Bradford pear, they're gonna tend to be light gray and very, very smooth compared to wild plums, which are one gonna be much darker in color and they'll tend to be more brown in hue than gray. Another thing when we're looking at flowers is that their distribution is very different between them. So with Bradford pear, they will often come in these somewhat spherical clumps and they won't be as evenly distributed. When we're looking at wild plums, especially if we're seeing a thicket, they will look like they are way more evenly dispersed all throughout the thicket. You don't tend to see as distinct of clumps when it comes to wild plum. All right, so now you've gotten very close. You're looking at the flowers right in front of you. What details can you use then? For one, Bradford pear is going to typically have anthers. Those are the parts that hold the pollen that are pink in color. The anthers on wild plum will be yellow in color typically. In many cases, Bradford pear flowers are gonna be somewhat larger than wild plum. This is especially true when comparing Bradford pear to Chickasaw plum. However, there are some plum species and individuals that can get larger flowers. So this last detail is gonna be the biggest dead giveaway. If you smell the flowers of Bradford pear, they are going to be fetid, almost smelling like something rotting. They're gonna be distinctly unpleasant, not something that you wanna smell. Compare that to wild plums, which have a sweet, pleasant, incredible aroma. It's one of my favorites that you can find in nature. The difference is incredibly stark between those two. You'll never mistake it from that. But when we're talking about distinguishing feral fruiting pears from Bradford pear, both of them have a somewhat unpleasant aroma to them. So we need to use other details to distinguish them. And don't worry, they're also very easy to spot. But first, let me show you the downloadable guide that I made so you don't have to remember any of the details and that you can take them with you wherever you go. And here they are right here. So for all the characteristics that we've looked at in this video, they're written out in this guide with photos to accompany them. And it's a PDF. So you can also just put it on your phone to carry it with you anywhere that you go. Or if you prefer, you can print them out and laminate them like I've got them right here. Check out the description for details on how to get yours. All right, so now let's talk about distinguishing feral fruiting pears from 
Bradford pear. So first, a little bit of a note of the origins of these trees. All of these are non-native to North America. However, I wouldn't really ascribe the term invasive to the feral fruiting pears. They just don't really spread that far, and they also offer a little bit of value of being a decent fruiting tree compared to Bradford pear, which is really just a noxious invasive. Yes, I've heard of people like kind of making something with the fruit. I've experimented with this. I've never been able to make anything that wasn't just incredibly astringent. So um, in any case, it's not worth it being here. We should try to get rid of it. And another thing that I want to note is that unfortunately, because Bradford pear is so invasive, if you just come across some random tree in the wild, chances are that it's probably going to be a Bradford pear. I have only ever found a few feral pear trees and they've all been in a extremely suburban setting. So it's probably planted at some time in the past and has just persisted and is still out there. Nonetheless, it's good to know how to tell these apart. So here's what you can use to distinguish the two easily. The first thing is the size of the flowers. So on our feral fruiting pears, their flower size is going to typically be two and a half to three and a half centimeters in length compared to Bradford pear, which is typically going to be one and a half to two and a half centimeters. So the feral fruiting pear flowers are going to be larger. But let's say that you're out in the field and you don't have a ruler with you, or maybe it's right at two and a half, and it's hard to gauge what the size is. There's another detail that is a big giveaway. So you're going to have to look close for this one. You might need something like a loop to observe it, or you can just use your phone and take a really close up photo. Uh, it has to do with the style. So the style you can think of, it's like the stem that holds the pistil. So this is part of the female reproductive system of the flower. And they're gonna come in the very middle of the flower. On Bradford pear, it will have two styles on them, two. Compared to feral fruiting pear, and those are typically gonna have five, sometimes four styles on them. Look closely, that detail is there, and it is a huge giveaway. These trees are going to flower usually in late winter to early spring. That's the time frame. But what if you had all of winter to scout for wild fruit trees? If you watch this video right here, I'm going to show you the details that you need to know to identify five common fruit trees in the middle of winter. I really think it's going to be helpful to you. And I have another tip for where you should be looking for them. So I hope to see you there.